I'm going to ask you if you have your Bible, turn with me over to the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It'll be the fourth book of our New Testament. We're going to go to John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. And I'll ask you when you have found it, only if you're physically able, would you stand with me? We'll read. I'm going to read verses 1 to 15. <clears throat> John chapter number 3. This is be a very familiar passage to most people here. <clears throat> the Bible records there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Notice he says, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. But Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Therefore, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Now the wind will blow where it wishes, and you will hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it's the same with everyone who is born in the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness of what we have seen. I told you, do, and, but you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, that is the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you will use this word to impact people's lives when it comes to this subject of being born again. And we're going to lift up Christ and give you the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. My dear friends, on March the 30th, 1964, NBC launched a brand new daytime television game show. But this particular game show launched by NBC in 1964 was different than the other game shows. It was very unusual. See, this particular game show gave the contestants the answer up front and then it was up to the contestants to ask the question and get the question right. And we all know the name of this game show hosted by Alex Trebek was called Jeopardy. Exactly. Absolutely. It was a state-of-the-art game show that is so popular that it ran from March 1964 and it's still going today in March 2024. The game show is 60 years old this month. And uh, Jeopardy was very popular for that reason. And by the way, Jeopardy still stands as the number three most watched game show in America, right behind Deal or No Deal being number two and Wheel of Fortune being number one. I can't believe Price is Right is number four. I think that should be up in there. But anyway, uh, but what was interesting about Jeopardy, they would give you the answer. They gave the contestants the answer. And then the contestants' job was to try to ask the question that matched the answer. And it was an interesting TV show, and I was thinking about Jeopardy as the Lord was moving in my spirit and in my heart about this particular message, and the Spirit spoke to me and said, Son, just like Jeopardy, I'm giving people the answer, but they're not asking the right questions. And I've come by to tell you this morning, my brothers and sisters, that in our text this morning, Jesus has an encounter with a man by the name of Nicodemus. Now, let me tell you a few things about Nicodemus, just so we know where we stand. The Bible says that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Now, what was a Pharisee? 
A Pharisee was a very well respected and beloved religious leader in the community. Did not serve in the capacity of a priest. Was different from what we call Sadducee. They were the working class people that had a lot of clout and a lot of respect. And once they made it to the level of Pharisee, there were special perks and privileges that came with that title. They were loved and respected by the people. They were considered in many cases the religious authority. And they were always the crowd giving Jesus the most problems. Imagine that. The people that gave Jesus the most problem were the religious people. Isn't that interesting? And nothing has changed, by the way, just in case you want to know. Nothing has changed. I get more problems. I get more people wanting to debate and argue with me out of the religious circles than I ever did in the world. I mean, I'd much rather just preach the gospel of Jesus, and if folks want to fight over things, let them fight over it. I'm too busy trying to rescue people that's drowning, amen? And so Nicodemus is a Pharisee, but not only is he a Pharisee, Scripture says he's a ruler of the Jews. Now, that might not mean a whole lot to you and me, but in the first century when it was written and all this was going down, it meant a whole lot. To be a ruler of the Jews meant that he was a member of the Sanhedrin court. In Jewish culture, the Sanhedrin court was the highest court in all the land. It would be the equivalent here in America to the Supreme Court. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Nicodemus had wealth. Nicodemus had influence. He had popularity. He was smart. He had logic. But there was something that he didn't have. He didn't have a real covenant with God because he had rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. But he heard about Jesus. He heard about his teachings. And he was very curious. He wanted to know, could this really be the Messiah? Could this really be the promised one that we've heard about? And Nicodemus reveals something very telling in the passage there. He reveals to Jesus in their conversation that he and the other Pharisees have been talking about Jesus. And he reveals, check it out, we know that you have come from God. He reveals that piece of information. So it leads us to ask the question, if they knew that Jesus was from God, why did they fight him so hard? Because you see, friends, according to the Bible, these religious leaders were, were known by Christ and called by Jesus the synagogue of Satan. You see, when you hear people talk about Christians, we need to support Israel because they're the chosen people of God, you need to realize there's two groups of people that fall under that category. One group Jesus calls the synagogue of Satan. Another group Jesus calls the remnant. It's the remnant that we support. Amen? Oh, you, you'll research that when you get home. Then you'll see what I'm talking about. Jesus has this encounter with Nicodemus, and Nicodemus wants to know, how is it that you know all the things that you know? How is it that you understand the Torah? You understand the law and the prophets. How is it that you know these things? I mean, we know that you had to come from God. We know you didn't just come out of nowhere. How in the world do I find eternal life? And friends, many people struggle with that that answer when you ask him that question. How do I find eternal life? So many people that I've talked to just in my ministry, and I've asked that question, how do you know you're born again? How do you know that you're saved? How do you know you're going to heaven? How do you know you're in covenant with God? How do you know you're going to make it to heaven when you leave the walks of this life? And the number one answer I get is I'm a good person. That's the number one answer that I get, I'm a good person. And I don't disagree with them. A lot of times they are good people. But here's, the, here's, here's what we're missing, church. Are you ready? There's two standards of good. There's good by people's standard. And that's what they are is good by people's standard. But then there's good by God's standard. Good by people's standard means that you're a nice person. You could probably call them and count on them to help you if you needed help. And, you know, they don't go around bothering people. And they're just pretty good people overall. But to be good by God's standard means that when God sees you, he doesn't see your sin because mm, your sin's been paid for by Jesus Christ. There's two different standards. 
we want to get by by man's standard, but we're not going to be judged by man on the judgment day. We're going to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we got to be good by his standard, not man's standard. Is anybody picking up what Pastor Hunter's dropping down this morning? And so understand people say, well, I'm a good person. Or they'll say this, I donate money to different causes. That's a wonderful thing. I'm glad that you do. You ought to. But that does not secure salvation. If any of you out there, whether you're watching online or whether you're here at the church, you ever decide you want to make a large donation to the church, we would be glad to accept it. We'll use it for good church ministry. But I want you to understand this. That is not going to get you to heaven. I cannot say some kind of prayer that's going to get you to heaven just based on the fact that somebody donated some money to a church. Money is not salvation, and salvation is not money. Some of the most godly people I've ever known in my life have been poor when it comes to money, but they were rich because they knew the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm talking about people that could not, people that could not hardly afford to pay their bills, but they were in such right standing with God, they could call on the Lord's name and they could see things happen. Yes. Donating money is not going to do it. And I hear people say, well, I attend church years ago. I won't name the church and... I certainly won't name the person. But years ago, I pastored a church, and I had a deacon in that church, and he proudly made an announcement one morning that said, well, I know I'm going to heaven, he said, because I've been in church my whole life. I've been in church my whole life. I know I'm going to heaven. And friend, if you're, if you're counting on your church membership or your church attendance to get you to heaven, it's not going to work. Now, I want you to come to church. Don't think I'm against it. I want you to come to church. I want you to come because when you come to church, you got a family. You've got a village. You got people that think like you do. You got folks that love you. You got people that help you. We got a little community thing going here, right? We're helping each other. You need a church. You need a family. You need support, right? You need all those things. But just going to church will not get you to heaven. You might hear about how to get to heaven, but being here won't get you there. Well, I'm just going to be nice. Or, well, you know, Brother Hunter, I'm not really worried about it because, quote, God loves everyone. That's not necessarily a true statement. Some of you look shocked that I'm saying that. Does God have a humanitarian love because people are human beings? Sure he does. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Technically, his one and only son. That word begotten is a mistranslation, but I will we'll deal with that on, in another session. But my point being is, people have many different answers when it comes to this question, what must I do to make it to heaven? Jesus says you must be born again. And what I'd like to do this morning is just take a few minutes from our text, and I just want to give you the answer, if you will, to the question, how do I inherit eternal life? And as I look at the life of Nicodemus, some of you may see some parallels between your life and his, and I just want to take a few minutes and share with you. Verses 1 through 3, we are introduced to Nicodemus. We find out, as I said earlier, he is a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. And notice in verse 2 it says he came to Jesus by night. And the reason that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night was because he didn't want to see him talking to him during the day. He was sneaking around under the darkness and the cover of night because he didn't want the other Pharisees to see him talking to Jesus. Well, how dare you, Nicodemus, go over there and start questioning him about all of this kind of stuff? Because Nicodemus wanted to know something was drawing him to our Savior. Something was pulling him to the Messiah. Nicodemus knew he wasn't normal. He knew that something was different about him. But Nicodemus thought, that before meeting Jesus, he thought that his influence could gain him eternal life. I'm a Pharisee. I'm a member of the Sanhedrin. It's about as high as you can get when it comes to quote-unquote religion. But the problem is, Mr. Nicodemus, religion doesn't get you to heaven. A relationship with Jesus gets you to heaven. My goodness, if I had some Methodists here this morning, they'd be shouting and clapping their hands. Woo! Position of authority. People think my position to get me there. I'm an important person. I'm an important person. 
And I'm so important, God's going to make sure that I make it to heaven. People worried about the title on their desk. I have a title on my desk, and that, that means that I'm in a certain category, so to speak. And I don't worry about these spiritual things because of this title on my desk. Friends, I need you to understand something. There have been many a people that had a title on their desk that said pastor that didn't make it to heaven. Oh, I'm going to say it again because you look shocked. There have been a many a people that had a title on their desk that said pastor that didn't make it to heaven. They might have been religious. They might have held the office of a preacher, but they never was born again. Nicodemus wasn't born again at this time anyway. He had a position of authority. He had a title on his desk, if you will. He had a lot of money as well. Pharisees, when they reached a certain level, they got certain perks and benefits. They started cashing in on the tax collecting business. You read all through the new four gospels about this person was a tax collector and so on and so forth. They got to get a skim or a cut off of that. People think, I've got money. I've got influence. I have wealth. You ever met somebody that just had so much money they were incredibly arrogant? You ever met anybody like that? I mean, just thought that they were really the, 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 uh, uh, the apple of everybody's eye because they got a little bit of money in the bank. Let me tell you something, friends. Money will come and money will go. Salvation is eternal. So you say to yourself, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Will my influence gain me eternal life? The answer is no. You must be born again. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. But I'm a Pharisee. You must be born again. But I'm a leader in the Sanhedrin. But you must be born again. But I'm religious. But you must be born again. But I'm a good person. But you must be born again. But I'm doing everything. But you must be born again. Second thing I noticed, verses 4 through 8, Nicodemus tried to, tried to use logic and tried to logistically find a way out of this thing. He says to Jesus, can a man be born again when he is old? I mean, can I go back into my mother's womb and just be reborn again? What he was really saying was this, Jesus, how can I be at this age or at this point in my life and now you're telling me that I must be born again, how can I go back and change after all this time? Nicodemus knew he couldn't physically be born again, so what he's saying to Jesus is, how do you expect me to change after all of this time? Since the time I was born from my mother's womb, can I go back and change? Jesus says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Friend, I need you to understand that my logic cannot explain eternal life. Spiritual principles are not explained through natural logic. They just simply aren't. The reason that so many people are non-believers is because they're trying to explain spiritual principles with logistical reason, and it does not fit. God didn't make it that way. God is a spirit. He dwells in the spirit realm. He has spiritual laws that he operates by. There are connections from the spirit to the natural. But understand, you can't take natural reasoning and natural logic and figure out the ways of God. It's just simply not possible. Salvation is not a logical thing that you can think your way through. Eternal life doesn't always make sense to us. Why is it that God will save the poor beggar on the street that seemingly means nothing to nobody, but yet God loves them enough he'll save that person, and yet the guy up on Wall Street making all the money that everybody likes that's very influential lives his life and dies lost without God. Why is it? Because logic can't explain salvation. Logic can't explain the things of God. You can't explain God using your logic and your reason. It's not possible. How in the world does God come into the life of a person that's an addict and then take them away from that addiction and put them on the road to recovery? Only God can do that because it's a miracle. How in the world can God take a marriage that's on the rocks, that's crumbling, that's about to just fall apart and turn that thing around and make it stronger than it's ever been? Only God can do that because it's a miracle. How in the world can I be sick, Pastor Hunter? And suddenly I go to the doctor and they look and they can find no trace of it. How in the world does that happen? Logic cannot defy the things of God. You can't define God with logic. It's not possible. 
Salvation is not just something that happens in my mind. It's something that happens in here and changes me from the inside out. No wonder Paul wrote and said, if any person is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Thank God for that. Oh, thank God for that. Old things have passed away. My gosh. I got some old things in my life that I really would like to be buried and stay dead. The old has passed away. But praise God, the new has come. The last thing I want to say is this. Salvation really is a supernatural experience. It really is a supernatural experience. Jesus said, you must be born again. And one would ask the question, well, why do I need to be spiritually born again? Well, friends, if we go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, the author explains it this way. The author said that because of one person's sin, that was Adam, death came into the world, and therefore death spread to all men, and because of that, everybody sinned. So we've all sinned in our life. There's not anyone who's never not. Even if today you said, I'm never going to sin again, and you meant it, and you walk the rest of your life sinless, well, you still got a sin record you got to deal with. You still got a past you got to deal with, and only Jesus Christ can forgive you of that sin. But the author there in Romans says that death passed to all men, and he's not talking physical death. He's talking spiritual death. People are spiritually dead to God. And because we're spiritually dead to God, we've got to be spiritually born again to Christ. So we're dead to God through sin, but we've got to be born again through the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, that's a supernatural experience. Most things that I experience are in the natural realm, but salvation is in the supernatural realm. God has to open my eyes in order for me to understand. See, John 6, says that in order to be born again, God's got to draw you to him. You say, how will I know that God is drawing you to him? You will know. You'll know when God is pulling you to him. You're, you're going to know it. There will be no question in your mind that God is pulling you to him. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes as a result of hearing and hearing comes from the Word. So this morning, you've heard the Word presented. So you've heard the Word, and because of that, if God draws you today, if you'll trust Christ by faith, He will change you, and you can be born again. What is the answer, church? What is the answer to how do I inherit eternal life? Here's the answer. You must be born again. I'm going to ask you to bow your head for prayer with every head bowed and every eye closed. I would like to address our online audience just for a moment. <clears throat> I want to say to our online audience, thank you very much for joining us and being a part of this experience, whether you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook or live or you're listening on Spotify. We just love you and we appreciate you and we thank God for you. But I just want to take this moment and invite you to experience what it means to be born again. Pastor Hunter, how do I do that? Well, as I said earlier, you heard the word preached. God draws you to him. You have a decision to make. And here's that decision. I'm going to turn from my sinful life. I'm going to turn from my old ways. And I'm going to believe in Jesus Christ. I'm going to follow him and I'm going to embrace salvation. That's your choice. Now, you can either do that or you can say, well, I'm not ready now, and you can just go back to your sinful life. But, friend, there's no guarantee that you'll live to see tomorrow, and there's no promise that God will give you another chance. If God is drawing you, if he's calling you, don't wait and make a decision now. For everyone else that's here, I would like to extend the exact same invitation to you. Now, maybe some of you are here and you would say, Brother Hunter, I know that I'm saved and born again. There's no question about that. But you know, life is tough. Life's been tough for quite a while. And as a result, I find myself kind of sliding backwards a little bit. And I don't mean to, but it just kind of happens. Maybe that's you this morning. You need prayer. We'll pray with you. Maybe you're here today and you would like to be born again. You can come and we'll pray with you and you can make that decision today. Maybe you're here and 
you've got something going on in your life that doesn't have anything to do with the message today, but you still need prayer, I want you to know that we're available to pray with you. Ladies, my wife is here to pray with you. I'm here to pray with you, fellas. And listen, maybe you've been thinking about putting your membership here in this church. This is a great day to do it. Maybe you've been considering this baptism thing. This would be a great day to commit to it. Whatever your need is, whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind, we want you to come this morning. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house today. Thank you for the word that you presented to us. I pray that it will help your people. In Jesus' name, amen.